It's the greatest role-playing game in the world. Hundreds of millions of dollars in sales per year. A new movie with Chris Pine in it. It's the heyday of Hasbro's Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons. But if you aren't read into the ugly part of this success story, I want to share some thoughts with you today. I'm going to formulate these thoughts into five items under the heading Reasons Why You Should Quit Playing Watsi's Version of Dungeons and Dragons. Let's just jump right in. One, it's not the best version of D&D. Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition is hard to run because it continues with the long-standing expectation that DMs spin all kinds of plates. Ben Milton of Questing Beast addressed this and termed it a crisis that has resulted in a drastic shortage of DMs to run the game at large. It's totally true. 5e is a pain in the neck to run, especially when you consider the expectations of new players and people who have learned how to play by watching Critical Role and Stranger Things and other exaggerated portrayals of an ideal, almost mythical session of D&D. In actuality, the combat is slow in plotting, the characters get way too powerful, way too fast, and there are too many weird player options that have departed so far from a cohesive sense of lore or universe that the term kitchen sink doesn't even begin to describe it. And it's all, almost every last page of every last official 5e book, written in a way that feels like the authors are trying to pad the page and meet some sort of page quota. So what is the best version of D&D? That's completely subjective. You might have had some incredible times with friends or randos online or at a game shop using 5e, and no one can take that away from you. But in terms of a version that actually delivers tactical combat in a way that actually feels substantive and tactical, the current form of D&D 3.5e, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, crushes 5e in this department. And in terms of a version that gives DMs and players an approachable palette of Western fantasy to work with, and which actually trusts those parties to use their imagination instead of spelling out every last thing, and empowers the DM by not dumping superhero PCs in their lap, that version would happen to be BX, or BX with a sprinkling of AD&D as presented in Gavin Norman's old school essentials. The problem at the core is that 5e is a bloated mess for GMs to run, with gameplay, a series of combat encounters that get worse and worse as the players ascend to HP bloated godhood. And I know hope springs eternal. For example, Dan DeFazio of DungeonCraft, someone who I feel has some authority on the subject of D&D, says top D&D designer Chris Perkins just might simplify the Dungeon Master's Guide in this next iteration of D&D and save the whole franchise. But just some food for thought on that, the fifth edition of D&D is almost entirely encapsulated in the player's handbook. And maybe Perkins will have a hand in streamlining that book as well, but the company has already bragged that they aren't going to make any big changes to the 5e rule set, wanting instead to establish their game as so good now that it basically doesn't need to change. So really, don't get your hopes up for a simplified official new version. It's just going to be the same convoluted mess. And really, I don't know why there's any faith placed in Chris Perkins on this front anyway. He wrote what is considered one of the, quote, best official adventure supplements for 5th edition, Curse of Strahd, and I personally spent weeks trying to untangle the contents of that book and make it usable for my table. If this book is Perkins' crowning achievement, don't hold your breath for simplicity in 2024. 5e is not even the best version of D&D 5e. What I mean by that is that there are well-established games that outdo 5e at its own themes, which shouldn't come as a surprise since 5e has overextended itself in trying to be a game with the most mass appeal. First, there are games that are actually like what people who have never played 5e think 5e is like. Fantasy, fast, and fun is what they're hoping for, and it's actually 13th Age with its much more streamlined combat and non-combat mechanics, or Fantasy Age, which comes with better exploration rules and deeply simplified character class options. Also, Shadow of the Demon Lord, which was created by a former 5e designer, does come with the baggage of a very dark setting, but rules-wise is much more logical and simple than 5e. And by the way, that game is about to get a sequel, that sheds the whole grim dark theme, so you're going to have a completely superior game to 5e. Look for Shadow of the Weird Wizard in 2023. If you want big fantasy heroes doing big fantasy things, then Cubicle 7's Age of Sigmar Soulbound is just more honest about delivering the goods. You're explicitly a fantasy superhero in that game, and again, the mechanics are much more approachable than 5e. For example, zones are used in combat instead of a grid. 
Another example of high fantasy with extreme action is Savage Worlds for Pathfinder, which, long story short, uses the gonzo but approachable rules of Savage Worlds and applies them to Pathfinder's very well-conceived fantasy world, Galarian, replacing the crunchier rules of Pathfinder itself. If you want a dungeon crawl, put your 5e books down and pick up Torchbearer or Dungeon Crawl Classics or Old School Essentials, which is, again, a recap of D&D BX from the early 1980s. Each of these games is dedicated to the actual details of dungeon crawling. They have focus on the matter, which means you get a more focused experience without the GM having to backfill all the shortcomings of the 5e rules. If you want the mythical party-like 5e experience that is depicted on Critical Role and the Eddie Munson show, then go ahead and pick up Index Card RPG. This is a game that tried in every possible way to leave out unfun elements, so all you're left with is a quick-moving role-playing game that almost feels like Old school Zelda with its gear-based abilities, and GURPS with its ability to adapt to any setting you throw at it. If you want just straight up superheroes, pick up Mutants and Masterminds, or again, Index Card RPG with the Vigilante City supplement if you need something fast and super easy. Its chiefs, directors, and shareholders think you are livestock. If you haven't heard, there was a recent shareholder or stakeholder meeting where the top corporate officers at Wizards of the Coast were basically reassuring people that they know the Dungeons & Dragons franchise isn't making enough money, and this despite record profit margins in 2021 so obscenely high that the CEO of WotC was made CEO of its parent company, Hasbro, but that they have every intention of fixing this under-monetization problem. I've left a link below to a recording of part of that meeting so you can listen for yourself, but in a nutshell, they want to monetize more players rather than just the DMs of the hobby, and they want to do this by expanding their multimedia offerings. More movies, shows, toys, board games, collectibles, and most importantly for you as a gamer watching this video, subscriptions to access D&D's RPG game content. As the great Mitt Romney once said, corporations are people, which isn't true, but if corporations were people, they could for the most part be considered sociopathic. All a corporation ultimately wants to do is increase quarterly earnings, growth at any cost, any cost. If you look at a game company like Modifius or Free League, it's run by a handful of people who try to make the best games and game supplements that they can because that's how they're judged. If they succeed, they get to eat for another year, but if they put out games that suck, they'll fade away pretty quickly. They are flesh and blood people trying to survive. Our sociopath corporate body friend, Hasbro, on the other hand, is playing a completely different game. They are orders of magnitude larger in size, and they wield a marketing budget that dwarfs every third-party and independent RPG publisher's budget combined 10 times over. They don't need to make a great RPG or improve on their RPG substantially in any way. The D&D role-playing game is just one small cog in their operation, and that operation is to extract money from you and hobbyists like you at regular intervals as if you were milking cows on an industrial dairy farm. And what they intend on feeding you is smaller and smaller bits of cud in the form of online microtransactions. It started with the digital dice, but soon it will be 3D environments and artificially scarce digital goods. The inconvenient truth is that they always had bad intentions, but they weren't as good at carrying them out before. Take for example, the fact that since day one, all 5e books have retailed around $40 to $50, but are glue bound and will sometimes fall apart on you. You would think that with economies of scale, where making more of something makes it cheaper to produce, they could have mustered some stitch bound books at 50 bucks a pop, or maybe partnered with a company that doesn't make such embarrassing minis. But no, this is a sociopath trying as hard as they can to make as much profit as they can. The only thing you have to look forward to from them now is parody levels of D&D merch garbage and bald face digital grift on the virtual tabletop. Who are you really supporting when you buy an official 5e book anyway? CEO Cynthia Williams? A corporate veteran of Xbox Live's player retention and Amazon's e-commerce departments? And her colleague Dan Rawson, who just came from Microsoft 365? Look, I know there are some people out there who criticize Free League for making too many games these days or picking up IPs that they don't like, but the guy at the top of that company designs the games himself and he plays them too. I'll make a gentleman's bet with you that Cynthia Williams and Dan Rawson don't play test the questionable RPG supplements that they're selling. Do they really deserve your money? 
Writers are squeezed for word count at best, exploited at worst. Have you ever seen those handwritten notes found in clothing and other products that are secretly put there by the workers in the factory where the product came from, imploring the consumer to get them help since they're working in horrible conditions against their will? This is the exact feeling I get when I read official 5e rulebooks. I get this sense that the contract writers are screaming in anguish as they try to fill page after page with something creative or useful, but there's a supervisor behind them that's asking them for more and more pages. And then they just collapse into writing filler that only looks like it's supposed to be used in an RPG. And as it turns out, these contract writers don't get paid much. Why should they? They're receiving the privilege to write for the greatest role-playing game in the world. They'll gain so much respect and reputation after being named in Ravnica's whatever that they'll be a known quantity in the industry. Unfortunately, the low pay isn't the worst of it. I won't get into all the details in this video, but you should read Orion Black's account of working as a creative consultant at Watsi. I'll leave a link below. Basically, they might steal your ideas as a consultant, present them as their own, and then cut you loose. This is no game working for Watsi. Third party 5e content, on the other hand, is a place where writers and artists can actually make a living. And coincidentally, it's where you see the most unbridled creativity for the underlying rule set. I personally feature third party 5e content on this channel because of those things. Their creative merit and the underlying morality or lack of amoral exploitation in their creation. But since we're being frank here, I do think that making a great third party 5e supplement or adaptation is like making lemonade out of lemons. The lemonade can be quite tasty, but it's a real design challenge. RPGs are so much more than D&D flavored fantasy, and it's never been a more interesting time to branch out. So we covered the versions and offshoots of D&D itself, which might be better than 5e, as well as games which do the various things 5e tries to do, but better. But believe it or not, this is just peeking through a tiny keyhole into the world of RPGs. There are so many other experiences that you can have in a role-playing game besides Tolkien-esque Gygaxian fantasy. That's been the case since the early 80s, but really, games have never been as varied and well-conceived as they are right now. Just looking at the games I've reviewed on this channel, there's a whole cyberpunk genre which can come in the standard flavor of cyberpunk red, or the originalist flavor of Blade Runner, or maybe a modern take like Hack the Planet. There are games where you can play as a kid on a bike, uncovering mysteries in your small town. Games where you are out in space, either in some official IP like Star Trek, or something crazier like Battle Lords of the 23rd Century, or Nibiru, or Death in Space. You can learn sign language in the course of play, or make up your own language with everyone at the table. The seventh edition of Call of Cthulhu, along with its monster manual, is so well polished that you could exist in that dark world with friends for years. Then there are a plethora of solo games where the objective is to spin up a tale of survival or suffering or even just something for the sake of being epic, all with a journal and a pen. Then there are games that emulate the trials and tribulations of being a teenage monster or a teenage superhero, and others that perfectly recreate the experience of the Jurassic Park movies or the Expanse novels and TV show or Dune or Judge Dredd or G.I. Joe or Transformers. It goes on and on and on. These are just a small selection of RPGs that I've reviewed over the years. And in total, on my channel, I haven't even uncovered 5% of the best of the best games out there. With all this in mind, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons and their upcoming 1D&D service product game are an infinitesimally small glimpse into the wider world of role-playing games. Some people argue that we need WotC in order to bring more people into the hobby, but the absolute need for growth is really just another myth that's drilled into our heads from birth. It's true that growth of the hobby could lead to ever more and cooler RPG experiences for more people, but if it's at the cost of getting milked by Hasbro Gaming Division, and at the cost of writers and artists getting underpaid and exploited, then I think it's fair to say that the cost might be too high. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the new year.